The Lord is great and greatly to be praised. I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise shall continually be in my mouth. My soul shall make her boast in the Lord. The humble shall hear of and be glad. Oh, magnify the Lord with me. Let us exalt his name together. If it weren't for the mercies of God, we would all be consumed. But his compassion fails not. Great is thy faithfulness. Oh, my God. If you guys would just think about the goodness of the Lord, think about the great things God has done for you. I promise if you start thinking about God, you'll start praising him. Praise him for his goodness. Praise him for his grace. Praise him for his mighty works. And if you can't think of anything else to praise him for, praise him that you got up this morning with a reasonable more than a strength and that you're in your right mind. Glory be to God. Hallelujah. Oh, that men would praise the Lord for his goodness and for his wonderful works unto the children of men. Lift up those hands and just say thank you. Lift up your hands and just say, God, I love you. In the name of Jesus, hallelujah. Glory to God. Amen. Giving honor to God, my Lord and Savior, Jesus, who is the Christ. Giving honor to the reverence of God in the house of God today. To Bishop Reed, to whom I am most grateful for this preaching opportunity. To Pastor Johnson, to my fellow brethren, my clergy, all that are related to me by the blood of Christ, good morning. Today is a day that the Lord has made. We shall rejoice and be glad in it. Amen. Why don't you just look at your neighbor and say, God is great. God is good. God is powerful. And I love him. Hallelujah to the Lamb of God. I'd like to thank my family, my friends, my fellow co-laborers in Christ for being here today. You know, you don't have to be appreciated in life. People don't have to support you. People don't have to acknowledge you. But when they do, you ought to say thank you. So I'm grateful for all that are in the house of God today to be in worship and in support of me. Well, in the early 70s, I was a high school student. I was active in student government and public oration. I enjoyed speaking um, to governor bodies in, in the schools, uh, enjoyed going out, doing conferences, meeting other student government persons that were from other high schools. But as exciting as that was, even in that, I did not feel I had anybody that I could relate to. Until one day I was watching television and I saw this woman and she was proclaiming from a public pulpit. She was neatly dressed, profoundly poised, and wore a big afro. They started flashing pictures of her on the screen, and one picture in particular caught my eye. She was sitting in a big back wicker chair. Yeah, you guessed it. Her name was Angela Yvonne Davis, an activist for political justice and social and economic equality. The next morning, I washed my hair, and I refused to allow my mother to straighten it with a hot comb. Y'all know what I'm talking about. You know that hot comb? That comb made of stainless steel with a big, wide wooden handle. You sit it in a flame of fire that's on your stove, and you pull it through your hair to straighten it out. Y'all know what I'm talking about. Not me. Not that day. I washed my hair. I blowed it out. I pushed it around, and I had one of those big afros. And I walked around with my fists up in the air and said, power to the people. Black power, power to the people. And while I was never a Muslim, every now and then I would say, as alaikum. 
and I would wait for the response, assalamu alaikum, just because it sounded good and it seemed to align with this newfound movement to unite black people. Later that year, a man named Gil Scott Heron wrote a poem, and he put that poem into a song, and the song was entitled, The Revolution Will Not Be Televised. Y'all with me today? Many of the references and allusions over 40 and 50 years ago were in that song, but the core message of the song still resonates today. The song opens with a declarative statement. It says, you will not be able to stay home, brother. You will not be able to plug in. You will not be able to turn in. You will not be able to cop out, for the revolution will not be televised. Mr. Heron warned that the police, the government, and all those responsible for social, political, and racial injustice would not be able to hide from the revolution because they wouldn't see it coming, and they wouldn't see it coming because the revolution would not be. And then he started to repeat, the revolution will not be televised. The revolution will not be televised. The revolution will not be televised. That song was released in 1974. It's now 2023. Angela Davis is 79 years old. She's a retired UCLA professor of philosophy. And Mr. Gil Scott Heron died at the age of 62. The revolution that they spoke of was a plan to effect change toward the achievement of justice and equality, but they were never able to pull it off in their own strength. I know of another impending revolution. The ultimate revolt against the world laden with sin. Jesus Christ, the Son of God, will return to revolutionize this world. And he has the power to pull it off. No man knows the day nor the hour, and we will not have time to get ready. We must be ready, for his return will not be televised. If you have your Bibles, please meet me in the book of 2 Timothy at the third chapter. I'll be reading from verses 1 through 3. If you're able, please stand for the reading of God's word. 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 1 through 5. When you have it, say amen. If you're still looking, just say, help me, Lord, and he'll let one of your neighbors help you find it. And it reads thusly, this know also that in the last days perilous times shall come. For men shall be lovers of their own selves, covetous, boaster, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, without natural affection, truce breakers, false accusers, incontinent, fierce, despisers of those things that are good, traitors, heady, high-minded, lovers of pleasures more than lovers of God, and having a form of godliness, but denying the power thereof. From such, turn away. The subject, the theme, the central thought of the text is dangerous people in perilous times dangerous people in perilous times. You may be seated in the presence of the Lord. Father, in the name of Jesus, we ask even now that you are with us. We thank you, Lord God, that you are in the midst of us, and we're asking that you would put shoe leather on your word, that we might not walk in the way we, we might not leave the way we walked in, but that we would be changed and that we would continue to seek your face, that we might be contoured, shaped, and chiseled, and to the image of your son, Jesus, who is the Christ. We bless you and we praise you. In Jesus' name, amen. While there is some discrepancy among Christian scholars, Nero, the emperor of Rome, who reigned from about 54 to 68 AD, is remembered throughout history as being vain, morally depraved, and a monster. He murdered his younger brother, 
He murdered his mother, whom he was also said to have been sleeping with. He murdered his pregnant wife and a list of others that are far too numerous to name. He covered Christians in animal skins and had them torn apart by dogs and then doused them with tar and used them as human torches to light up the night sky for his events. I said this man is known throughout history for being a murderer, for being horrendous, for being evil spirited. But what he's most known for is nearly burning down the entire city of Rome. And he burnt it down because he was so egotistical that he wanted it to mirror himself. But when he burned it down, there were some accusations, some accusations all around him. And in order to rid himself of the accusations that he himself had done it, he blamed it on Christians, of whom the Apostle Paul was the lead. So Paul was sentenced to death and later decapitated. He had his head cut off. Prior to his demise, however, Paul, being fully acquainted with the mental, moral, and spiritual depravity of Nero, while sitting on death row, if you will, in a cold, callous, crummy, dilapidated jail cell, he anticipates his death and is motivated and even compelled to write this second letter, this second epistle to his disciple Timothy, who was pastoring at the church of Ephesus at the time, a church that Paul himself had planted. Timothy is warned that we are going to be seeing perilous days, dangerous days, and dangerous people. Paul was concerned about the diffidence, the timidity of Timothy. Once again, Timothy was a pastor, and his call was to preach to the people. And the truth of the matter is the condition of the world had changed, and he was concerned that Paul might not have what it took to get the message across. So even though he was in jail, and even though he was in the most dismal conditions you can imagine a jailer to be in, he still had the presence of mind and the passion of heart to reach out to Timothy in the second epistle, in the second letter, to realize and help him recognize that there are going to be perilous times. So Paul, in essence, says to Timothy, hey, man, I really need you to hear what I'm about to say because we're getting ready to go through something in this world, but not only in this world, in the church. So here in verse 1, he begins the letter with the words, know this, that perilous days, dangerous days will come. I noticed two things in the text. One was he didn't start out saying perilous days will come. He prefaces his statement with know this also. This particular no is in the present imperative, meaning he does not just want Timothy to know what he's reading while he's reading it. He wants Timothy to know that knowing this must be a perpetual, a persistent state of knowing that requires action. Somebody say amen. The second thing I noticed in the text is that the perilous times Paul describes have nothing to do with disease and plagues and pestilence and natural disasters like COVID and the invasion of lantern flies and hurricanes and tsunamis, earthquakes, wildfires, tornadoes, things that literally result in mass destruction across the globe. But it has everything to do with the destruction that people can cause unto people. I want to paint that picture for you because I know you've seen on the news all the hurricanes and tornadoes and natural and the destruction that they cause. They flatten out cities. Amen. They flatten out homes. They flatten out people. But Paul, when he talks about perilous times and dangerous people, he's not talking about that kind of thing. He's talking about the type of danger and destruction that people can bring. So by implication, once again, the destruction that one man can bring on another man in perilous times through dangerous people is far worse than any tsunami, any earthquake, any wildfire, any tornado, any pandemic. In fact, Jeremiah 17, 9 says, the heart of man is deceitfully wicked above all things, and who 
can know it. In 2 Peter 2, Paul gives us hope through the proclamation of truth and the correction of error that false teachers and those that follow them might wake up from their sins and repent. Well, my sisters and my brothers, maybe they will and maybe they won't. But in the meantime, the church and the church then and the church now needs to know how to navigate through time. According to the text, there are three things that we must know. We must understand the opposition, verses one through four. We must understand the deception, verse five, the A portion. And then we must understand the response that the church needs to have to the opposition and to the deception, verse 5b. In verses 2 through 4, Paul describes 18 different human characteristics that identify dangerous people. In verse 2, he says, For men shall be lovers of themselves, covetous, boastful, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, and unholy. This type of character, these types of characteristics are directly opposed to Matthew twenty-two thirty-seven, 37, which says, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the great and first commandment and the second is like it, love your neighbor as yourself. My brothers and my sisters, when a person is a lover of self, there is not enough room in their hearts to love you. You'll always be second to their fleshly desires. You'll always be second to what it is that they want. Your opinion will always be second to their opinion, which is the right opinion. Come on, talk back to me. They are their own God. Practically speaking, my sisters, it's like, you know, if you're getting ready to go out and, you know, your husband or whomever you're going out with is taking longer to get dressed than you, and you st you see you fully dressed, you're sitting in the living room waiting, and he's still in the mirror, patting his face and combing his hair. And when he finally comes out, the first thing he says is, oh, no, I'm sorry, baby, for taking so long. But he said, how do I look? <laughs> Beware. We're talking about lovers of themselves. <laughs> Brothers, if every time you see that sister, you talk to that sister, she's talking about what she wants and what she needs and her, she got cups for hands and always taken and never given. You go and open up your refrigerator and all you see are empty containers of fast food. You can't never get a hot meal. Beware. We're talking about lovers of themselves. My brothers and my sisters, we're living in the last days. And as innocent as those two examples might sound, please know that they will grow in intensity. Matter of fact, Nero, he used to butter people up before he killed them. Before he killed his wife, he threw a banquet for her, softened her heart, and then kicked her in the stomach and beat her to death, killing her and her baby. I'm telling you, the spirit that was in him still lives in the world. Beware, we're living in the last days. Nero, the emperor, was a lover of himself. He was unbridled, he was immoral, he was treacherous. He set humans ablaze and used their burning bodies as lampposts. He cut off the innocent man's head for his own pleasure. The same spirit lives today. Just last week, a little baby boy, 12 years old, was found in a dumpster in West Philly with his head cut off and his body wrapped in a comfort. Wake up! We're living in the last days. 
Our children are murdered in the streets in cold blood by their own kind and by the ones that pledge to protect them. We're living in the last days. People are dying on porches and living rooms as stray bullets enter their homes. We're living with dangerous people in perilous times. There's no room for timidity. There's no room for timidity. We need to know that we know that we know and we need to know how to react to what it is that we know and what is happening because of what we know and the times that we're living in. The way we currently react to the times we're living in can be parallel to a story I once heard about a stage play that was held at a theater similar to the sight and sound in Lancaster, Pennsylvania that we all enjoy. The production of the play was magnificent. The people were enthralled by the stage lights, the sound effects. The scenery was draped in high fashion and the cast was absolutely phenomenal. In the midst of the play, the owner of the theater took center stage and announced that there was a fire backstage and everyone had to exit the theater. The crowd perceived him to be part of the act and they began to applaud him at the brilliance for changing the storyline. Oh, it was so smooth. It went from just excellence from a play to the storyline of the owner of the theater coming out and standing up and saying, it's a fire in the back and you all have to leave. And they just applauded. Whoa! how smooth a transition. The crowd perceived him to be part of the act and they began to, to applaud him and the curtain began to catch fire. And the audience began to applaud him even more. Oh, look what he did, the social effects, the effects, the effects, the sound effects, the visual effects. Whoa, what a play, what a play. The owner stood up and said, I've said all I can say. And he left the theater and the entire theater and everybody in it burned down. They didn't take heed to what was being said. Take heed, my sisters and my brothers. We're living around dangerous people in perilous times. The world, and in some instances, the church is the stage, and the truth that is being proclaimed by the preacher is the cast. Day after day, week after week, we're in front of the church, we're in front of the world saying we're living in the last days. Dangerous people in perilous times are at hand. Repent from your sins and turn toward God. Jesus is coming back. Jesus is coming back. He'll return to the earth and he's looking for righteous people. He's looking for a church without spot or wrinkle. No man knows the day nor the hour of his coming. We can't get ready. We must be ready because his return will not be televised. And the people are still sitting in their seats in front of the TV watching in disbelief as if what they're seeing is a stage show at sight and sound. Singing and hearing, hearing and seeing, but changing nothing. Then Paul goes on to say that there are people that appear kind and caring, but really they're covetous. There's those 18 characteristics of people that Paul says we ought to stay away from. Lovers and themselves and now covetous people. They don't want to be like you, they want to be you. They want your life, they want your husband, they want your wife, they want your children, they want your ministry, and they want everything you possess. They're pretending practitioners, imposters, appearing to be friendly and supportive, but they lie awake at night, tossing and turning, trying to figure out how to get you out the way. One day, one day, one day, one day. One day my intuition suggested to me that one of my neighbors had an eye for my husband. And so I said to myself, self, <laughs> learn before you leap. It seemed that whenever he was working on the lawn or, you know, in the garage with the door up, she would make herself visible. 
She would come out of the house, you know, under the guise of walking a dog. So without mentioning it to my husband, I decided to test the theory. I came outside, I played in the yard. The whole time I was out there, no neighbor. No sooner than I came in and my husband went out, she showed up. I said to myself, self, that might just be a coincidence. So I continued to test the theory. And when I was certain of what I was seeing and certain of what I was sensing, I decided to do a little test. So I went outside and I started trimming the bushes and I started trimming the hedges and I deliberately and purposefully left the, the clippings of them on the ground. And then I left the house. Because I knew that when my husband pulled up into the driveway when he saw the clippings on the ground, the first inclination he would have would be to clean it up. Sure enough, I left, I came back, I made sure he was home, I came back, he was outside clipping up the, cleaning up the clippings, and guess who was outside with him? I said, self, you've learned, now it's time to leap. I came out the car, I said, hello, how you doing today? She said, fine, I wish I had somebody to clean up my stuff like you. I said, well, this one's taken, honey. But sisters, I'm talking to y'all, that wasn't enough. She kept coming at me. So I said, oh, she, I said, this one's taken, honey. She said, oh, he don't want somebody old like me. But she said it with a question mark in her voice like she was waiting for him to answer. So I said, no, baby, he, it's not that you old. That's not why he wouldn't want you. He doesn't want you because he's married to me. So don't take your little old self right on back across the street. And I ain't seen it since. I'm talking about covetous people. Who wants your life, who wants your wife, who wants your house, who wants your, everything you're living and everything you possess, they don't want to be like it, they want to be it. Paul says, stay away from those kinds of people. And if that story didn't ring your bell, all you got to do is look at a, a movie called uh, the, the Sitter, The Sitter, 2007 movie, The Sitter. And it's simply this, it's simply about a, a nanny that they allowed to come into the house who became infatuated with the husband and decided that she was going to get rid of the wife so she could take her place. It's a real thing, covetousness. So Paul is warning us in the word of God to the people of God that the church has infiltrated the world and these are the things that have to be considered so that we can understand the opposition, understand the deception, and know how to deal with it and navigate it through this life. Somebody say amen. Not only, not only, not only are people lovers of themselves, not only are people covetous, but they are boastful. They brag about things and, and they're proud and they're puffed up and they don't have a reverence for God, Paul says. Nothing to them is sacred. They have no respect for their moms, their dads, the government, or anybody in authority. I said we're dealing with dangerous people in perilous times. They're unthankful. The more you do, the more they want. The more you give, the more they expect. And holiness for them is they're not even acquainted. We're living in dangerous times with dangerous people. All these human characteristics have infiltrated our church. People all around us are without natural affection. Men are having sex with men and women are having sex with women and the government has the audacity to call it a marriage. The word of God said the marriage is between a man and a woman. A marriage is for companionship. A marriage is for sexual fulfillment. A marriage is for procreation. A man and a man and a woman and a woman cannot procreate nothing. A man is fit for a woman. A woman is fit for a man. She's designed to receive. He's designed to give. It's a fit. Ain't nothing bumping up against each other. It's a fit. And then the LGBTQ plus community has the audacity to use the rainbow as a sign of pride. Don't you know the rainbow is a sign from God ordained to remind his people that the world won't be destroyed by water this time, but by fire? 
It's a covenant between God's people and God. I said we're living with dangerous people and perilous times. Then he goes on to say that in the last days, men will be truce breakers, having no loyalty to one another. The ones you thought you could trust, you really can't. After they get what they want, they stop calling. You stop by the house, you call them up on the phone, nobody answers. No loyalty. Truce breakers. They falsely accuse, they lie. They're incontinent, meaning that they're stubborn, always bucking up against the system. Always got to have it their way. Paul is trying to warn us of what it looks like so that we don't get tied into and, and boozled by people that have these characteristics. Good things irritate them. They spin it. They got to keep on working with it and take and find something negative about it because anything good is irritating to them. You know anybody like that? They're heady, high-minded. They think they're smarter than you. If they could see themselves outside of themselves, they would see how stupid they really look to other people. And the final and most dangerous characteristics of the end time is that lovers of pleasure more than God. We're in a world. We're in a world, but we're not of the world. We're simply pilgrims passing through. There are people in the world and of the world that have infiltrated us, our church. Don't you know that you, my sister, you, my brother, are actually the church? The conversation that Jesus had with Peter was, who will men say that I am? He said, you are the son of God. He said, flesh and blood didn't reveal that to you. Our father which is in heaven. And he said, upon this rock meaning the confession and the truth that Peter just gave about who God was. He said, upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against this. So you and I are the church. So when we come into this building, we come into this building, but the building is not the church. So when we talk about infiltrating the church, we're not talking about infiltrating the church building. We're talking about infiltrating you and me. We're living with dangerous people in perilous times. So not only do we have to understand the opposition, not only do we have to understand the deception, but we have to understand our response to it. Our response is a clarion call, a call that can be aligned with the men of Ishakar. The men of Ishakar were the sons and grandsons of Jacob and Leah a group of men who understood the times they were living in. They were leaders and they were fighters. They even had the good sense to follow a judge by the name of Deborah into battle to break the stronghold that the Canaanites had over them. Despite her gender, they realized and they recognized that she was called of God. And these men who were known to be wise, these men who had the wisdom of God, these men who were known for their wisdom followed Judge Deborah because they knew Judge Deborah was sent from God. They knew the signs of the times. Not only did they know the signs of the times, they knew how to navigate through the times. The world is changing, my brother. The world is changing, my sister, and we cannot remain as we were. We must change with change. It's a jungle out here. The streets have become war zones. We must be prepared for the battle. We wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against spiritual weakness and darkness in high places. But the battle is not ours. It's the Lord's. According to Mark, uh, Matthew 24, 6, You'll hear the wars and rumors of wars, but don't worry about that because the time is not yet. The Bible says such things like this must happen, but the end is still to come. But in the meantime, not only must we recognize that opposition, 
Not only must we understand that deception, but we have to know how to respond. The world is hungry for the living bread, and the Lord is near. There's too much hate in the world and not enough love. We must worship not just as a means to refresh us, but as an activity the Lord uses to destroy the works of Satan on earth. We must pray as a collective body to release the unprecedented measure of God's power. We must be effective in ministry. We must evangelize and we must disciple. I know you're hurt, my sister. I know you're hurt, my brother. I know you're tired, my sister. And I know you're tired, my brother. I realize and I recognize that you feel like God may have cut you. That person that got murdered in the street, that might have been your loved one. And you're angry. But remember, beloved, Jesus was cut on Calvary. They put a crown of thorns on his head, cut. They pierced him in his side, cut. In his humanness, his esteem was cut. His hope was cut. His confidence was cut. So much so that he cried out, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Cut. They hung him high. They stretched him wide. And for us, he died. They put him in a borrowed tomb where he stayed all night Friday, all night Saturday. But on the third day, he rose with all power in his hand. Sometimes God has to cut us to cure us. He has the power to cut. He has the power to cure, but he has the authority to make it better. He has the power to cut, and he has the power to cure. He has the power to conceal, and he has the power to reveal. When the Son of Man comes in his glory, and all the angels with him, then he will sit on his glorious throne. Before him, he will be gathering all the nations, and he will separate people one from another like shepherds separate sheep from goats. That will be a revolution. That will be a return of Jesus Christ, and it will not be televised. You can't get ready, my sister. You can't get ready, my brother. You must be ready, for he's coming again for a church without spot or wrinkle, and you won't know it in advance because his return will not be televised. The doors of the church are open. The doors of the church are open. The doors of the church are open. You may not know him. You may not know this God that we talked about. You may not know Jesus Christ and the pardon 